Some of the most pressing challenges of our times are seemingly wicked problems. These challenges are usually characterized by three things. <coughs> Novelty, in that they're new, we've never seen or experienced them before. They're not readily understood, nor do they have a clear solution. These challenges are often bigger than ever before, so pushing us past our normal capacities to respond. And or, they're complex. Essentially, with complicated interdependencies creating a combination of issues and events to grapple with. Climate change and extreme weather events like Hurricane Sandy are examples. They have huge impacts. These intractable, pro intractable problems bring uncertainty and challenge our normal capacities and <coughs> routines and demand more innovative ways of problem solving. What may work in an everyday business as usual environment may not work when multiple factors come into play. At these times, scenario planning and adaptive processes come to the fore. In the wake of Sandy, the unprecedented damage hammered home to all, the to all who were affected the vulnerability of our coastal cities and towns and the real threat of a more frequent and extreme weather events. The costs are huge, with financial costs in excess of $65 billion, it was clear from the outset that the recovery <coughs> was not just about rebuilding what existed before, it was not a viable option. There was loss of life and there was loss of livelihoods. The community impacts were enormous. But it's more important to note that for every dollar spent on mitigation or preparedness, whether mitigation or adaptation, it saves four dollars down the road on post-disaster rebuilding. In fact, I notice I've got five dollars there, but anyway, it's meant to be four. <laughs> yeah, but it's a huge difference. So we do not have any excuse not to do what we need to do now. So post Sandy, there was a clear imperative at all levels of government, federal, state and city, to build resilience in the region. To ensure the region is more res resilient next time round, it was acknowledged we need to build back better. To develop new paradigms, we need to think and act differently. The good news is that out of disasters come opportunities and an imperative for innovation. Post Sandy, a range of new initiatives are being tested, including competitions that promote resiliency through innovative planning and design. Examples include Rise New York City's competition, Structures of Coastal Resilience, and probably the most ambitious of all, Rebuild by Design. All issues, whether environmental, social or economic, have spatial consequences. Design is seen as a key tool for dealing with such complex problems. By revealing interdependencies, integrated strategies that build resilience, sustainability and livability can be created. Designers as collaborators, visualizers and synthesizers can unpack issues and model scenarios in new and very different ways. Using the rebuild design process as a case study, this lecture considers the potential of such a process to drive innovation and deliver resiliency projects and strategies that can be implemented and leveraged to have a catalytic impact on a broader scale. Rebuild by Design, or RBD as it is known, came out of the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD. It had multiple aims. And these were stated as addressing vulnerabilities, both structural and environmental, developing solutions that better protect the region from future events, strengthening understanding of regional de interdependency and fostering coordination, and above all, developing resilience, both locally and nationally. But how is RBD different? The competition is innovative in a number of ways. The standard model for federal design competitions is to define an existing problem, develop a brief, solicit solutions from the best of the field, and select a winner. Like many wicked problems that cannot be easily defined and solved readily, Sandy and the challenges of resilience defy political and disciplinary boundaries. 
The uncharted territory suggested an open-ended question and a regional, in a regional interdisciplinary cross-jurisdictional approach. Thus, RBD rethinks the America Competes competition model itself. It started with an open-ended question and a regional approach, and then it attracted a diverse talent pool. Rather than limiting the field to teams of, rather than limiting the field, as is the normal competition process, creative thinkers were sought internationally. The selection of teams with a broad range of disciplines and integrated team structure was devised to solicit a multiplicity of ideas and approaches, as well as more holistic strategies. The program is also different. It's devised and driven by Henk Ovink, a lead partner from the Netherlands. It is fast paced, eight months in total, short, sharp and focused. The process involves research and design and a range of ideas shared through an open innovation paradigm. <coughs> Community Development Block Grants, or CDBGDR funds as they are known, are the primary federal dollars that will fund the implementation of RBD proposals. R R R RBD represents a policy innovation by committing to set aside these funds specifically to enable implementation of winning projects and proposals. Grantees are typically asked to develop an action plan for these funds only after they are allocated. RBD informally changes this by developing innovative proposals before funding is given. Federal dollars are thus being become not simply a mechanism of implementation, but another catalyst for innovation. This is dovetailed by team efforts to secure their own funding for additional development, fueling the extension of the outreach and the scope. And finally, as the goal of the process is to drive a new level of re resilience across the region and at a broader scale, the structures in which resilient efforts are typically conceived and implemented needed to be addressed as well. Even if RBD fosters the innovation necessary for a new level of resilience, it risks pr producing proposals incompatible with existing systems and structures. The RBD process therefore aims to rethink those structures as well by engaging with communities, not-for-profits, government agencies and local, state and federal leaders at every stage to build new co coalitions of support and capacity in tandem with each design proposal. All good so far. But this poses a number of questions. How effective is the design competition as a venue for resilience innovation? And what are the key opportunities and challenges of such a design-led process? As the jury is still out, we will not know for some time if the design competition will ultimately deliver innovations that better engage and prepare and adapt the region to a changing climate, or indeed whether in fact they can be scaled up. But we can make observations as to whether the design competition demonstrates a level of innovation and potential impact over and above the standard process. I've been following it to find out. HUD, in collaborate in collaboration, in collaboration with NYU's Public Institute of Public Knowledge, the Municipal Arts Society, the Regional Plan Association, the Van, Al Van Allen Institute, and with financial support from the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation and other sponsors, developed the three-stage competition. The involvement of these project partners was needed to establish credibility, robust public outreach, and indeed to secure other sources of funding and program support. Stage one began with a call to designers from around the world to participate. From a huge field of submissions, 10 multidisciplinary teams were selected. The teams include over 200 experts, primarily from planning, design, engineering, development and ecology. The sheer number of participants, range of disciplines and integrated team structures has enabled a multiplicity of ideas and approaches, but also more holistic strategies to be developed. <coughs>